Welcome to Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD, where we explore the intersection of health and hypermobility for dancers and other artistic athletes. This is co-host Jennifer Milner, here today with Dr. Linda Bluestein. Before we introduce today's special guest, please remember to subscribe to the Bendy Bodies podcast and leave us a review. This really helps grow the audience and increase awareness about hypermobility and associated disorders. This podcast is for you. Today, we have the great pleasure of speaking with Dr. Svetlana Bleachstein, board certified neurologist and director of the Dysautonomia Clinic. She's also the clinical assistant professor of neurology at the University at Buffalo Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. Dr. Bleachstein completed her neurology training at Mayo Clinic Graduate School of Medicine and is a member of the American Academy of Neurology and American Autonomic Society. She serves on the Medical Advisory Board for multiple nonprofits, including Dysautonomia International, Dysautonomia Information Network, and the Ehler Stanlos Society. Dr. Bleachstein has been an invited speaker at national and international conferences, including at the World Health Organization. Dr. Bleachstein has been the principal investigator on a number of important research studies concerning POTS and autoimmunity, POTS and pregnancy, POTS and vitamin deficiencies, and others. She co-authored a popular patient handbook called POTS, Together We Stand, Riding the Waves of Dysautonomia, and has been interviewed by numerous media outlets, including U.S. News and World Report, Medscape, Neurology Today, New Scientist, and others. She's the recipient of the Patient's Choice Award 2019 from Dysautonomia Support Network, Business First 40 Under 40 Award, Mayo Clinic Neurology Research Award, the American Headache Society U.S. Human Health Award, the American Academy of Neurology Student Prize, and others. In our last episode, we sort of broke down the whole umbrella term of uh, dysautonomia and talked about POTS specifically, also looking at small fiber neuropathy, breaking down uh, Chiari malformation, kind of digging into what is under that umbrella with dysautonomia, going into POTS, um, going into how people can sort of get a diagnosis of it. And we wanted to go a little bit deeper here. If somebody has a diagnosis of POTS, um, if somebody is hoping to sort of minimize their own symptoms? What are some things that they can do oh. to help minimize the symptoms of POTS, either with their diet, with over-the-counter medications, and or uh, environmental changes? What would you suggest? Excellent question. So the mainstream therapy consists of non-pharmacologic approach, which we always employ first. We ask our patients to increase their fluid intake to at least two liters per day with a combination of electrolyte drinks and water. Similarly, we ask patients to increase their salt intake in the form of sodium chloride through the use of dietary salt and salt tablets, and there are quite a few out there. We advise them to try wearing compression stockings and abdominal binders to cause external vasoconstriction and get blood back up from the lower body to the heart and the brain. We also recommend sleeping at an incline of about four to six inches, which may help the body conserve sodium and water at night. And we ask patients to eat small frequent meals low in carbohydrates. Exercise is an important management strategy, which is not without controversy. First, as I mentioned before, exercise intolerance is one of the hallmarks of POTS, but exercise is also necessary in order to prevent secondary deconditioning. There is still some prevailing belief among some of my colleagues that POTS can be caused by deconditioning, but several studies have challenged that concept by demonstrating abnormal cardiovascular physiology that's at play in POTS patients versus healthy but deconditioned patients. So ultimately, we recommend an exercise program that diminishes the effects of gravity and allows the patient to exercise while sitting or laying down. Using a recumbent bike rowing machine 
or swimming in the pool has been the most effective exercise that our patients can tolerate. The key is to start low and go slow to build up the exercise capacity to at least 30 minutes of exercise four to, four to five times a week. Now, unfortunately, in many patients that come to me, which tend to be the sicker patients, medications is going to be necessary to control the symptoms and allow the patients to start exercising in the first place. Very good. And in terms of their, uh, when you were mentioning about like sodium chloride and or electrolytes, do you have any more specific recommendations in terms of, I know there's like tablets, powders, um, di different dosing regimens perhaps, and of course nausea can be a side effect of taking uh, sodium tablets. And um, there's a lot of products out on the market that are often marketed towards athletes, right? So, and some contain sugar, some contain artificial sweeteners. Do you have any additional kind of details since that's something that people on their own might make better or less good choices? So do you have any additional um, insights into that? Yes, uh, it's a very important question. Uh, and interestingly, I do not have any preferences and leave it up to the patient by saying whatever you can tolerate. As long as there is sodium chloride, which is your table salt, and as long as you're consuming at least five to seven grams for our young patients, some, some references say even go as high as 10 grams. If you have no hypertension, if you're a young person, you're welcome to liberalize your salt intake as much as you can. Uh, and that can be through whatever sources you tolerate. You know, some patients um, like to drink Gatorade. Fine with me. Other patients can tolerate Pedialyte. Great. Uh, yet, as you mentioned, some people complain that taking in a lot of salt causes nausea, in which case you want to pick those tablets that are enteric coated with a coating that prevents their dissolving you know, in your esophagus and stomach. Uh, many brands are available. Uh, I have no stock in any of them, except to say you can also use a salt shaker. Uh, take, uh, you know, <laughs> take your salt shaker and add salt to your water. Some people are not able to tolerate salt tablets in any form. So at that time, I say take a, you know, just simple salt from a salt shaker, add it to your, to your water, Add some lemon, add some cucumber, and drink this throughout the day. That way, that way you end up um, consuming both fluids and salt. Um, so that's the bottom line. Easy. Uh, you're welcome to salt your food. Uh, of course, salty snacks can be a very good way to boost your um, oral load of, of sodium and uh, water. Uh, and you can pick pretzels or nuts or olives, whatever, whatever you can tolerate. You know, some of our patients have allergies and sensitivities, which is why I'm very liberal. Um, and um, which is why I say whatever you can tolerate to get that amount in, that's fine with me. For our sickest patients with severe gastroparesis uh, or severe swallowing, mm -hmm. That is a big problem. You know, they're unable to consume enough fluids and salt, uh, and that makes it very difficult, which is partially why their pots uh, can be out of control. Uh, only in rare cases do I ever consider uh, things like um, continuous or chronic uh, intravenous fluids. Um, I typically do not recommend a port or a pick line even though many of our patients, as you know, really feel better with uh, intravenous saline, long term, it's not a good option. Now, some of my colleagues don't use that at all under any circumstances. Uh, you know, I am uh, more liberal on that. Uh, and uh, sometimes these are necessary. For example, you can use them as needed. Typically, I use them when a patient with spots experiences a, a significant deterioration following a viral illness like the flu, like the coronavirus, like a GI bug, uh, in which case I will refer them to get uh, IV saline and that typically helps them to feel better. 
Uh, and a special consideration should be given to our patients with Ehlers-Danlos and dysautonomia who have severe dysphagia or swallowing dysfunction or severe gastroparesis where they are unable to uh, consume that much fluids and salt. We have to be cognizant of that and make special arrangements for these patients. But in the vast majority, uh, try to to utilize them only on as needed basis and try to consume all of your fluids and salt orally. That, that sounds good. And I, I'm really glad that you brought up about the saline infusions because that definitely is a very important topic to, to address. Um, and then in terms of other specific things that people might be using, I know one thing that a lot of my patients use is soy sauce. It's high in sodium, but I also have the concern about the monosodium glutamate or MSG and that a lot of these people, with, if they have headaches. So do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, again, everything needs to be individualized. If you have a patient with spots and chronic migraines that are triggered by food, uh, then of course, a soy sauce isn't going to be uh, the option for you. But if you have a patient with spots who can tolerate soy just fine, fine by me. Uh, I think at the end of the day, to me as a clinician, it's more important that this amount of sodium uh, chloride and the amount of fluids are in your body on a daily basis than the sources. Of course, one can argue, well, there are healthier sources and less healthy. You know, in this patient population, uh, especially those with uh, significant allergy sensitivities or gastroparesis or abdominal pain, whatever you can find to get you there to your daily uh, recommended allowance of sodium chloride and fluids, that would be fine with me. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I, I love hearing the overall theme that it depends on the patient and that it should be individualized and that we, there are some great broad strokes that you follow, but you also um, look at each person and say, this person might just need this, and so we're going to do this. Um, that's, a, that's a great approach. Um, I wanted to change gears really quick. In our earlier conversation, you had mentioned uh, a couple of times fatigue and sleep disturbances being something that goes along with dysautonomia and, and, and pot specifically. So in this population, how common are sleep problems and um, what can be done about them? That's a very good question. And uh, if you uh, look clinically and ask patients, a vast majority will say that they experience significant sleep disturbance, whether it's insomnia, difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, or both. And when researchers tried to study that question, mixed results came in, with some studies showing that there were no significant abnormalities on sleep studies, mm -hmm. and yet other re researchers finding various abnormalities. So what that tells us, of course, as a lot of things in medicine and neurology, it can be hard to objectively catch uh, these, uh, these manifestations. Uh, when we talk about the Ehlers-Danlos population, there we have more evidence that there is a higher prevalence of uh, sleep disorders, such as obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea, as well as restless leg syndrome and other sleep disorders in patients with Ehlers-Danlos. Uh, so I would say it's a very important area that has to be addressed. Every day with my POTS patients, we discuss strategies to improve sleep. And when there is significant sleep disturbance, I always make it a priority to have a thorough evaluation and treatment. Because as I always say, you cannot get better if you have severe insomnia. You cannot get better if you sleep four to five hours every night. You cannot get better uh, if you have untreated and undiagnosed sleep apnea. Mm. Just a simple example, this happened yesterday. I had a young patient with dysautonomia, POTS, and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, 17 years old. By all stretch of the imagination, she should not be having a sleep disorder because she's young, she's not particularly overweight. But that's what we suspect when um, uh, patients 
state that they sleep nine, 10 hours every night, then they take a nap lasting four to five hours and they're still very tired. Lo and behold, I sent her for a sleep study, which returned with very abnormal findings of severe, severe obstructive sleep apnea. Mm. So I think that's an area that needs to be emphasized um, when you are evaluating patients with both pods and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Thank you. And, and we know that um, fatigue and sleep definitely go hand in hand. And you had mentioned in our earlier episode, some of the common comorbid symptoms like fatigue, headache, um, some of the comorbid conditions like small fiber neuropathy. Um, can you talk a little bit about why these are important to address and what types of strategies you might use in treating those? So as I mentioned, patients with spots present with multiple comorbidity. At least 80% of patients with spot POTS report at least one comorbid condition. The, the symptom burden in our patients is very high. And when you address these comorbidities, you improve symptom burden, and therefore you improve overall uh, health, overall well-being, and hopefully the functional status. So how do we do it? Well, first of all, we have to identify those comorbidities, diagnose them correctly. If they are unidentified, they're not going to be treated properly. Uh, and with the example of, of my patient with severe sleep apnea that I used, uh, it's very important to look for them. Don't assume that because you have a young teenage girl who appears to sleep 9, 10 hours, uh, that uh, there is no sleep disorder. Send them out for a sleep study. That's very important. Similarly, you know, we say that GI symptoms are very common in patients with spots. True. Don't assume that this is part of, G part of POTS symptomatology and you should just ignore it. Get a gastric emptying test. Identify whether they have gastroparesis. Uh, do check them for mast cell activation syndrome. Identify whether they have that comorbid condition as well. Because very commonly, if you identify a mast cell activation syndrome and you treat it appropriately with diet and medications, patients improve. And interestingly enough, even their orthostatic intolerance Past symptoms may improve when you dig deeper and uh, identify these underlying conditions. Similarly, with autoimmune disorders, I need to talk about that because time and time again, I have patients who are young women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who come to me with severe dysautonomia, lab blood pressure, uh, severe POTS, joint pain, all kinds of other underlying issues maybe positive autoimmune markers, maybe they had some dryness, maybe it's dry eyes, maybe it's dry mouth, which, you know, dry mouth is very common in our patients to begin with. Uh, they come to me and their Sjogren's antibodies um, are negative. So their doctors are confident that they have ruled out Sjogren's and rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. This is not the case. So what we know is that Sjogren's is the second most common cause of autoimmune neuropathy and often presents with small fiber neuropathy and dysautonomia. Uh, mm -hmm. And at least 40% of patients with Sjogren's have negative antibodies. Negative Sjogren's antibodies, is especially if they present with neurologic symptoms. So when you have a high index of clinical suspicion and when you suspect that there might be an autoimmune disorder. Maybe it looks like it is autoimmune, but all of the standard antibodies are negative. Send them for a minor salivary gland lip biopsy. I have diagnosed some of my patients with severe, severe dysautonomia, bed bound. I have diagnosed Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, and if it's not Sjogren's syndrome, there may be an undifferentiated Undifferenti there may be an undifferentiated connective tissue disorder. There may be other variants in that spectrum. And those are the patients that will certainly benefit from immunotherapy, whether it comes in the form of hydroxychloroquine as an immunomodulator 
or whether it comes in the form of IVIG. Excellent. So those patients, when you work them up, and if you've identified um, Sjogren's, that might be somebody that you would use hydroxychloroquine in, or if they're, if they're more functional as opposed to IVIG? You know, I always like to employ my colleagues in various specialties. So I, I would like to work with a rheumatologist, uh, and I oftentimes do. Now, however, the problem there is, uh, you know, that getting a diagnosis of Sjogren's or another uh, autoimmune disorder is quite difficult when the standard panel of antibodies come back is unremarkable. So it's a process. Uh, it's a process that certainly needs to be taught in residencies and fellowships for our rheumatology colleagues and also in neurology uh, because we need to be more aggressive with figuring out, with diagnosing, and then with treatment. So certainly hydroxychloroquine is what we would typically use as a starting point for mild cases that may be working or maybe not as impaired as our bedridden patients. But th that's one option. You know, there is also methotrexate and Celsept and many others. Uh, but it's important to identify because what I often see is that in my patients in their 50s or 60s, they present with a lot of comorbidities. Suddenly there is a lung manifestation and there is cardiac dysfunction and there is diastolic dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension and lymph nodes and nodules on scans and nobody knows where did that come from on the background of dysautonomia, parts and joint pain. Uh, and oftentimes there is an unidentified autoimmune disorder that was unmanaged. And so in your 30s and 40s, maybe it was okay. And then when you become older, the inflammatory autoimmune process is unchecked and untreated and things become worse. You know, there is also a small a percentage of uh, lymphoma and other um, cancer manifestations in untreated Sjogren's syndrome. So that's a very important area that those of us who see a lot of patients with spots need to uh, keep in mind. Very good. And in terms of other treatment options, we talked about fatigue and we talked about brain fog. Um, is there a time where you would use stimulants at all in this population? Um, yes, yeah. so fatigue is one of the universal manifestations of this autonomia. Um, some of our patients, at least 20% and probably more, actually qualify for a diagnostic criteria of chronic fatigue syndrome um, by various type of criteria that are out there. Uh, and as I always explain, fatigue is one of the hardest treatment to treat. Uh, fatigue is one of the hardest symptoms to treat. Uh, we can treat heart rate, we can treat tachycardia, we can treat hypertension, we can treat hypotension, we can treat headaches and neuropathic pain. But when it comes to treating fatigue, it's very difficult as we, A, don't understand that symptom as, uh, as the concept uh, and what type of physiologic processes underlie it. Uh, of course, it's going to be a combination of cardiovascular and the cerebral and mitochondrial and metabolic uh, processes, but uh, fatigue is multifactorial. Uh, and so, uh, yes, stimulants is one of the options that I use. Uh, they have to be used also on an individual case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and um, I think they can be quite effective, especially in our younger patients, maybe with comorbid ADHD, but those patients who are young without hypertension, whose blood pressure is normal, and who can tolerate a low dose of stimulants such as Adderall, Ritalin, Concerta, and others that can be very effective. We also have ProVigil or NuVigil that we can utilize. But I think it's important point to stress is that treatment of POTS effectively will ultimately improve generalized fatigue and can also improve brain fog. Uh, 
So it's very important to treat POTS effectively with medication treatment options for POTS before we jump to stimulants. That makes sense. And what, what recommendations do you give for people who are having difficulty finding a doctor to evaluate and treat their, their possible POTS or, or other form of dysautonomia, especially for those that, for financial reasons, you know, need to use their insurance rather than uh, you know, go to a practice that does not take insurance? So this is a huge problem in the United States and most other countries. There, there is significant shortage of, of practitioners who understand and specialize in, in autonomic disorders, which is why it's very important that we incorporate autonomic disorders as part of the training. Uh, and perhaps we need to start in medical school. I certainly haven't learned much, if anything, about autonomic disorders in medical school. I did learn about the autonomic nervous system as part of my physiology and uh, biochemistry and neuroscience course, but that's where we have to start educating medical students. Thereafter, plenty of opportunities for education during residencies, including internal medicine, primary care, cardiology, neurology, rheumatology. I think a lot of specialties will benefit from um, some kind of curriculum on autonomic disorders. You know, we try to give grand rounds and lectures and we write articles to get the word out there because ultimately uh, patients present to their primary care physicians. So everybody needs to be aware. Not, not, of course, we don't expect primary care physicians to, you know, go through this complex interplay of symptoms and workup and therapeutic options, which is why we also need neurologists, cardiologists, rheumatologists, and gastroenterologists to be somehow trained in these disorders to improve access. Uh, that's very important. There is American Autonomic Society who has done great things in promoting education. There is an um, um, autonomic disorders interest group as part of the American Academy of Neurology. There are many societies that are now using this and running CME courses. A and I have seen, I have seen palpable difference. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago, uh, there was a huge diagnostic delay and very few people knew uh, POTS or were able to diagnose it. And now I see people, patients presenting to me, you know, with the diagnostic delay is, is maybe a year, which is great, which is a huge improvement compared to six and seven years past. And now I see physicians. I see my colleagues in neurology diagnosing POTS, which is great. I see them use first line medication treatment options like midodrine, fluorineth, and beta blockers. So I think things are certainly improving. They are much better today than they were 10 years ago. Well, that, well that's good to hear. That's exactly what I was about I'm, to say. I'm going to be optimistic on that. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, de definitely. And it, because it is so frustrating talking to, I know I was speaking with a cardiologist not too long ago and he said, quote, well, POTS is very rare. So and there are a lot of myths. Certainly th some people think POTS is rare. Some physicians think that uh, POTS is only about heart rate and blood pressure, that you, if you just fix heart rate and blood pressure, you should be fine. I've had many cardiologists relate to patients how can you feel so sick? How can you be dizzy, fatigued, and you know having difficulty standing? You're standing now. Your heart rate is 90. Your blood pressure is 120 over 80. That's perfectly fine because POTS is not just about heart rate and blood pressure. And POTS is much less to do with cardiovascular system than it is with neurologic um, system than it is with neurologic control of the autonomic reflexes. And I think we're going to move in the direction of, you know, neuroinflammation, neurophysiology, neurochemistry that underlie POTS and many other related disorders. Um, cerebral hypoperfusion is one of the key mechanisms in our patients. And interestingly enough, uh, in a recent study um, from good researchers, um, those patients who were put on a tilt table test and who did not display, who did not have a confirmed POTS or neurocogenic syncope, 
they still had abnormal cerebral perfusion and they complained of symptoms. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how we move away from certain accepted notions and diagnostic criteria into the new area of research, which is going to be, you know, neuroinflammation, a cerebral regulation of blood flow and so forth. Excellent. And so if we have, um, you know, uh, providers, physicians listening to this and, uh, you know, other prescribers who have patients with POTS and they want to uh, you know, at least do some initial treatment with them. They do the stand-up test in their office and they do see that increase in heart rate of 40 beats per minute in age 19 and under or an increase of 30 beats per minute over age 19. And they want to go ahead and start some treatment. And of course, as you as we discussed earlier about the sodium and those kind of other, you know, sleeping with the head of the bed elevated and those kinds of things we should do first. But if that physician is willing to start with the medication uh, management, are there certain um, strategies that you would recommend in terms of what they might start first? And of course, we know that there are individual variations, but just as a, some general guidelines. Sure. So after non-pharmacologic treatment approach, which unfortunately isn't going to be effective for quite a few patients. The first line medication treatment options are going to be beta blockers that slow down the heart rate and decrease sympathetic overactivity. The key there is to start on a low dose, on a very low dose. Um, uh, we also have fludrocortisone, Florinef, which is a first line medication treatment option that helps the body to absorb all that sodium consumed in the diet and water at the kidney level. We have midodrin, which is an alpha-1 agonist that aids with peripheral vasoconstriction and pulling in the extremities, abdomen, and pelvis. Uh, there is also mestinon, anivabridin, and stimulants, as I said before, and other medications to target mast cell activation syndrome, neuropathic pain, and uh, headache control. Uh, and there is also the need to improve sleep patterns, of course, through non-medication treatment options first. Excellent. And we discussed in our previous episode um, a little bit about autoimmunity, and I just wanted to, to, to pivot a little bit to vaccination, because I know you've written a little bit about um, the uh, human papillomavirus or HPV vaccination and some cases um, of POTS following HPV vaccination. And of course, vaccination we know is now a particularly hot topic because of um, the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So could you talk a little bit about um, that paper that you wrote and what we should know about vaccination and the possibility of POTS um, or, or dysautonomia occurring following a vaccination? So I always start this conversation with the fact that I'm pro-vaccine. I follow all of the recommended CDC guidelines for immunization. And like many others, I am eagerly awaiting a vaccine for coronavirus to gain control of this pandemic. So regarding POTS and HPV vaccines, as you probably know, I was the first one to report an interesting patient that presented with new onset POTS after HPV. HPV vaccine. And she was a young college student who played college sports and became incapacitated after HPV vaccine. I subsequently reported a case series of six patients who presented with spots after HPV vaccine. So I thought I was describing an interesting case report and presentation of nuanced POTS. Well, little did I know that I would find myself in the middle of all of these events that unfolded next. Um, so countries like Denmark, uh, Japan, Mexico, Italy, and others uh, began reporting similar patients as I did. And, you know, suddenly I had calls from parents and patients and uh, people working for federal court calling me to represent all of those patients in the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, which is, you know, part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So that's how I got involved to be a medical expert on some of these cases. I felt I had to become an advocate for these patients uh, because they were reporting this onset and a triggering event. In, in some of the studies, large studies um, on POTS patients, 
um, a number of about four to six percent of patients uh, reported onset of POTS after vaccination, many of them after HPV vaccine and many and some of them after flu vaccine and others. So the way I describe this is, of course, on, in the vast majority of cases, um, this does not happen. But in some patients, very rare cases, perhaps, uh, vaccination with either HPV vaccine or, and perhaps others may trigger adverse events. We know that they happen in cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome and others. And so I think similarly, in some rare patients, this may lead to a new onset POTS or other autonomic disorders. Of course, the key is going to be personalized medicine. Identify those individuals who might be at risk for these adverse events through their genotype. Yeah. Interestingly, now with coronavirus, we are talking about some people who are healthy having the severe course with acute COVID resulting in ICU stay and, and uh, unfortunately even death. And these were young, healthy patients. Uh, I believe in a matter not dissimilar to this, uh, there are a few patients who are young and healthy who through their um, maybe unique genetic makeup may end up with severe adverse events. Uh, and that's important. You know, all of us who have worked um, on some of the papers and research collaboration, we, we uh, support vaccination, we believe in vaccines, and we just report adverse events uh, in order to ensure safety. Vaccination safety is such a big topic now and always has been. And when we um, ensure vaccination safety, we in improve compliance because a vaccine to prevent cervical cancer is so important and necessary. We want to increase vaccination rates uh, with HPV vaccine in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Excellent. And in terms of people who have had, we know that some people have vaccinations and, and have no side effects whatsoever, and other people have vaccinations and might have some, uh, you know, like more significant, like flu-like symptoms than, than other people might have. Are those maybe people that may want to consider, especially if it's like a series, you know, if it's a, if it's a three-part vaccine, for example, um, would, would that maybe indicate that they should be cautious in, in maybe getting the second part of that series, or is that completely un, unrelated, any more mild type symptoms? You know, none of it is known and none of it has been studied. So there are no recommendations uh, in that regard. Uh, but we do recommend, of course, that everyone gets a flu shot now and in the past. And then hopefully when we have a good, safe, and effective coronavirus vaccine, uh, that will be, you know, a, a, a significant breakthrough and possibly, a, you know, the end of the pandemic. So right now there are no guidelines how to identify these rare individuals who may react adversely. In the vast majority of cases, vaccines are going to be safe and necessary uh, with maybe some minor side effects like redness at the site of the infection or fever or something like that that's temporary uh, so that's important to understand um, that uh, the kind of work that i've done was on rare cases and interestingly enough it, it led to some investigation and you know we brought attention we also brought attention to POTS in general because I think many countries many physicians didn't even know what POTS was and now suddenly POTS is included in you know different kind of surveillance programs uh, to to track to track this as a possible adverse event. So I would love to chat a little bit about post-viral uh, dysautonomia, especially now with the coronavirus um, pandemic and these quote unquote long haulers that people that are having you know, prolonged symptoms following coronavirus infection. What should we know about that? The most common trigger of POTS is a viral infection uh, affecting at least 40% of our patients. And these includes viruses such as influenza, Epstein-Barr virus, antivirus, parvovirus, and others. So post-viral dysautonomia is common and what I frequently see in my clinic. Uh, 
With respect to COVID-19, when it appeared in the United States in early March, reports of some patients taking a long time to recover were already coming in from China, South Korea, and Japan. So I have anticipated that post-COVID dysautonomia may be a long-term complication of that virus, just like it can be a complication from other viral infections. We also knew from the SARS outbreak in 2002 that almost 50% of patients with SARS had lingering symptoms compatible with chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's not surprising that SARS-CoV-2, a virus related to the previous SARS virus, is causing a post-viral syndrome as well. I have seen a number of patients with post-COVID dysautonomia or long COVID. These patients are young people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who were either healthy or had minor medical problems that did not affect their functional status. And now, after having COVID, they are experiencing severe fatigue, tachycardia, dizziness, headache, numbness, digestive symptoms, and inability to exercise. Some are unable to work at their previous jobs, even if it involves work from home. Of course, there are no specialists in long COVID yet because the long-term effects and complications of this virus haven't been studied. The CDC states that 35% of people who had COVID-19 did not fully recover two to three weeks after having the virus. And at least 20% of these people were between ages 18 and 34. Uh, it would be important to determine through research whether long haulers have abnormal tilt table tests and other tests of the autonomic nervous system. There is one study from Germany that using cardiac MRI demonstrated evidence of heart muscle inflammation in 60% of patients with um, who had COVID two to three months prior. And almost 80% of patients had MRI findings of cardiac inflammation. In the US study of athletes, almost 50% had abnormalities on cardiac MRI and 15% have evidence of myocarditis. So these patients had mild COVID symptoms or were asymptomatic and ended up with uh, long-term complications. And we also have uh, estimates from Mount Sinai researchers that 70,000 of New Yorkers may be long haulers. Mm -hmm. So I think many physicians, including neurologists, cardiologists, and primary care physicians, would have to become familiar with these patients, given their neurologic and cardiac symptoms. Wow. Yeah, there's still so much more that we don't know yet, but um, it's great that people like you are thinking about this and, and looking at all of that. Um, you are such a wealth of knowledge. We are so grateful <laughs> well, thank <laughs> to you have you on here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, final question. You have talked so much about dysautonomia and given us so much to think about over these past two episodes. Where do you see the future of dysautonomia? And also on a practical note, where can people find you? The future of dysautonomia. Well, where do I begin? Uh, I think we <laughs> have made significant progress. Over the past 20 years, I have certainly seen uh, progress in research, especially with identification of antibodies, adrenergic, muscarinic, and others. Um, we have made progress with diagnosing and uh, raising awareness among clinicians with reduced diagnostic delay now compared to 10 years ago. But certainly progress needs to happen with effective therapies because there is no FDA approved medication for POTS and everything we have is used off label. Uh, and uh, the efficacy of these therapies uh, is suboptimal. They may, they may help some, but certainly they do not uh, result in uh, recovery or significant improvement. And we just had a study out of Italy that uh, had noticed improved um, symptoms over the course of two years, but um, 
no significant improvement in functional status where the patients were able to resume full-time employment or make significant progress. So um, as with a lot of neurologic disorders, and I consider POTS to be one of the neurologic disorders, uh, we need effective therapies. Excellent. So where can people find you on the internet um, if they want to read more about you, uh, try to get in touch with you? I am the director and founder of the Satanomia Clinic, where I see patients who are adults and teenagers with all types of dysautonomia. I also have um, uh, other providers who are very familiar with patients with dysautonomia uh, and are very important in comprehensive care that we offer to our patients. Uh, we have a clinical psychologist who is a PhD psychologist who works with my patients. We have a nutritionist who helps our patients with diet and nutritional uh, requirements. And we have a rehabilitation physician who works with our patients to improve their functional capacity. Uh, and she is also the wellness coach. Uh, and we have researchers who help us with our research studies. Um, so, uh, dysautonomiaclinic.com is where you can find us and you can email with consult requests for care. Excellent. And we will have that in the notes as well for the, for the show. We will have the contact information down in the notes for the podcast. So I wanted to ask what kind of patients would have access to be able to see you? Um, we offer consults to patients uh, uh, all over the United States and other countries as consulting services. We work closely with your local physicians um, to implement these recommendations and treatment options. So this is with our patients who are out of state. Uh, this is consulting service that we offer. Uh, but you do need your local physicians who can become a part of the treating team to help you get better. Excellent. Thank you. Well, you have been listening to Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD. Today, we've been speaking with Dr. Svetlana Bleachstein, board certified neurologist and director of the Dysautonomia Clinic. Dr. Svetlana Bleachstein, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Bendy Bodies podcast and sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you so much. It was great chatting with you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD, where we explore the intersection of health and hypermobility for dancers and other artistic athletes. Please leave us a review on your favorite podcast player. Remember to subscribe so you won't miss future episodes. Be sure to subscribe to the Bendy Bodies YouTube channel as well. Thank you for helping us spread the word about hypermobility and associated conditions. Visit our website, www.bendybodies.org, for more information. For a limited time, you could win an autographed copy of the popular textbook, Disjointed, Navigating the Diagnosis and Management of Hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and Hypermobility Spectrum Disorders, just by sharing what you love about the Bendy Bodies podcast. On Instagram, tag us at bendy underscore bodies and on facebook at bendy bodies podcast the thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely of the co-hosts and their guests they do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of any organization the thoughts and opinions do not constitute medical advice and should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever this podcast is intended for general education only and does not constitute medical advice your own individual situation may vary. Do not make any changes without first seeking your own individual care from your physician. We'll catch you next time on the Bendy Bodies Podcast. <music> <laughs>